هذا اعتقاد الشافعي ومالك وأبي حنيفة ثم أحمد ينقل نعم تفضل نعم principle 16 is whoever abandons the prayer then he has disbelieved whoever abandons the salah then he has disbelieved so this is a very simple principle um, that needs to be inshallah ta'ala understood and alhamdulillah you know uh, Sheikh uh, Abdul Hamam uh, Ali يعني, Sheikh Ali has just given me a quick reminder uh, to myself and to everyone inshallah that uh, which is very important, the reminder that he gave us, you know, you know, all know the Sheikh, he's been around for a long time in Manchester and, and he's experienced more things than, than we have experienced because he's, he's, very, he's older than us, mashallah, tabarakallah um, is that we should be careful when it comes to qadaya takfir and tabdeel so all of the things that you see, for example, this is bid'a or this is kufr then there, is, there are conditions in placing these rulings on specific individuals on specific individuals, so um, if something can be a bid'ah, but not everyone who does a bid'ah is considered to be a mubtada, an innovator, except with conditions. Conditions have to be met. The action can be a bid'ah, but the person can also be a mubtada if conditions are met, if certain conditions are met. Likewise, not everyone who falls into kufr is a kafir. Okay? And there's different types of kufr as well. So again, my brothers, we don't have the time to delve into these issues of takfir and tabdi' now. But if a person does fall into kufr, for example, that person may be someone who has an excuse. For example, I'll give you one simple example. The Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Allah, Allah said about him, وَأَلْقَ الْأَلْوَاحَ وَأَخَذَ بِرَأْسِ أَخِيهِ يَجُرُّهُ إِلَيْهِ The Prophet Musa, he threw the alwah. What was written in the alwah? What was written in the alwah? The words of Allah, the alwah is the Torah. The Torah was written, the words of Allah, so he threw it on the floor. Alqal alwah. And what is the ruling on a person? If you see someone throwing the mushaf on the floor now, what's the ruling on throwing the mushaf on the floor? That fi'l is kufr. But when the Prophet Musa did it, he was so angry, he didn't know what he was doing. Yani. Do you understand? He did Allah ma kafir. Allah Azza wa Jalla didn't make takfir of him. So we learn from this that some, if a person does some kufr, then that person could have they could be they could be ignorant of the fact that this is kufr they may think that this is islam so we have to be aware of these things but in saying that the root we still believe that these actions are kufr in and of themselves and we still believe that some of these statements the statements of the jahmiyyah the mu'tazila are kufr and some of them are bid'ah we still believe in it we still have to learn it we still have to warn against it but if someone falls into it, then that's a different ruling and that basically that person, we need to study that person, we need to see هَلْ أُقِيمَةِ الْحُجَّ عَلَيْهِ انْتَفَتِ الْمَوَانِعِ Was the proof, were the proofs established on them, were the mawani' were the, Are there any things that are preventing them from understanding the delil? And yeah, so this is something that inshallah ta'ala I just wanted to clarify to, to you brothers and just to remind ourselves inshallah. Naam, chapter 17. So, uh, naam, so abandoning the salah is kufr my brothers. If a person does abandon the salah, then this is kufr. Uh, if a person abandons the salah on purpose, then there's no khilaf between Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah that that person is kafir. If a person abandons the salah, juhudan, sorry, on purpose, and believes that the salah is not wajib upon them, is not wajib upon them, then that's kufr. Qawlan wahidan. There's no khilaf. But if the person abandons the salah kasalan out of laziness, then the correct opinion and the correct view Wallahu a'lam is that that person is a kafir because of the hadith of Shaqeeq ibn, Sa- ibn Abi Salama that he said that he met many of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and all of them took the view that if a person abandons the salah then that person has, co- has committed kufr and disbelief Naam, tafadda <coughs> Okay, 
الخلافة وكلهم إمام ونذهب في ذلك إلى حديث ابن عمر كنا نعد ورسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليه وسلم حي وأصحاب وأصحابه متوافرون أبو بكر ثم عمر ثم عثمان ثم نسكت ثم ثم نسكت ثم من بعد أصحاب أصحاب الشهرة أهل أهل بدر من المهاجرين ثم أهل بدر من الأنصار من أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على قدر الحجرة وسابق وسابقة أولا فأولا ثم أفطر الناس بعد هؤلاء أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أن قرن الذي بعد فيهم وكل وكل من من صحب من صحب سنة أو شهرا أو يوما أو ساعة أو رآه فوق فهو من أصحابه له من من الصحبة على قدر ما ما صحبه وكان سابقته معه وقصع منه وسمع منه وسمع منه ونذر إليه نذرة فأذناهم صحبة صحبة هو هو أكثر من قرن الذي قرن الذين لم يروه ولو لقوا الله في جميع الأعمال كان هؤلاء الذين صاحبوا النبي صاحبوا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ورأوه وسمعوا منه فمن رأى من رآه بعيني بعينيه بعينه وآمن به ولو ساعة أفضل لصحبته من التابعين ولو عملوا كل أعمال الخير. نعم. So these are the different ranks of the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم as you've just read. So this is pretty clear and self-explanatory. Um, so the best of this ummah after the Prophet ﷺ is Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman, um, and then Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and then Talha al-Zubayr, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, and then Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. All of them are, are, uh, يعني are fit and appropriate to become khulafa. And the proof is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar that's, that Imam Ahmed mentions. And then after Ashabu shura are the people, the Sahaba who, who took part in Badr from the Muhajirun. And then the Sahaba who took part in the Battle of Badr from the Ansar. Um, and everyone is, is, every companion is better than the last companion after them, depending on their Hijrah and Sabiqah, depending on who made Hijrah first and who uh, accepted Islam first, Awalan for Awalan. And then after the Sahaba, the best generation are the generation that came after them, who are the Tabi'un, and then the generation that came after them, who are the Atba'u Tabi'een. Um, نعم. نعم تفضل والسمع والطاعة. السمع والطاعة للأئمة وأمير المؤمنين قل وقل والفاجر ومن ولي الخلافة واجتمع الناس عليه ورد به ومن ومن عليه بالسيف حتى صار خليفة. أجزأت عنه برا كان أو فاجرا والصلاة والصلاة الجمعة خلفه وخلف من ولاه جائزة باقية تامة ركعتين من أعادهما فهو مبتدع تارك للآخر ومخالف ومخالف للسنة ليس له من من قدر الجمعة شيء إذا لم يرى الصلاة خلف خلف العلمة من كان من كان برهم برهم وفاجرهم فالسنة فالسنة بأن يصلي بأن يصلي معهم ركعتين ويدي ويدين بأنها بأنها تامة لا يكون في صدرك من من ذلك شك ومن خرج على على إمام من من عامة المسلمين وقد وقد كان الناس اجتمعوا عليه وأقروا وأقروا له بالخلافة بأي وجه كان بالرضا أو بالغلبة فقد شق هذا هذا الخارج عصى المسلمين وقد وقالف الآثار عن عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فإن مات الخارج عليه مات ميتة جاهلية ولا يحل قتال قتال السلطان ولا الخروج ولا الخروج عليه لأحد من الناس فمن فعل ذلك فهو مبتدع على غير السنة والطريق. نعم. So then principle number eighteen is principle number eighteen is hearing and obeying the rulers. Whether they're righteous or sinful. So Imam Ahmed, he mentions how can a ruler become a ruler. So some of the things that he mentions here 
is that he mentions how does a person, how can a person become a ruler? Um, is this is basically if a person is given authority, and the people gather around him, and they gather around the ruler, and they are pleased with him. So the ruler has to be male. So the ruler has to be a man, male. So in Islam, women, uh, it's impermissible for a woman to become a ruler, or or for her to be given rulership, um, and. Uh, yeah, and who, so the first per way a person can become a ruler is through a rida. If everyone agrees that that particular person is going to be the ruler, such as مثلا, when the Sahaba agreed on Abu Bakr anhu. Um, also, if a person overpowers the people with the sword, yeah, and it takes rulership by force until the matter is settled and he takes control of the country then it becomes wajib and obligatory for the people to follow him even though the way he became a ruler was uh, was in an oppressive manner but, ra but after they've become uh, they've, they've attained rulership then it is wajib and obligatory to follow them because not following them and fighting them will cause more bloodshed and in Islam يعني, يعني protecting the honor and the blood of the Muslims takes precedence also, the distribution of the spoils of war and establishing, um, and he says, establishing the prescribed punishments, this is for the ruler. Uh, and it's not befitting for anyone to rebel against the ruler, to incite hatred against the ruler. And this is not from the principles of Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah. Ah. Um, so, zakah is also given to the ruler, and whoever the ruler appoints to lead Salatul Jum'ah. Then it is wajib to pray behind that person. As long as they're Muslims, it's wajib to pray behind this person. And this is the responsibility of the Imam. Also, Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala, he warns us against rebelling against the ruler. And the Prophet وسلم, in many a hadith, he tells us and warns us against rebelling against the ruler. For example, an example of some of these hadith is the hadith of Wa'il ibn Hujr. He said, that Salama ibn Zayd al Jufi asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Ya Nabi Allah, O the Prophet of Allah, um, uh, if we have rulers in Raita in in Ra, if Raita in Qamat alayna Umara, if Umara and basically rulers uh, are appointed over us, and these rulers yes aluna haqqahum, they ask us to give them their rights." And they prevent us from our rights. Yani they oppress us. What should we do in this instance? So they're talking about tyrant rulers. So the Prophet turned away. وسلم, and then he asked him again. And the Prophet turned away from him a second time. Then he asked him a third time. And Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais, عنه, another companion who was sitting there, pulled him and said, Isma'u wa ati'u, fa inna ma alayhi ma humilu wa alaykum ma humiltum. He said in the presence of the Prophet وسلم, hear and obey and uh, hear and obey. Naam. Also from in another that in Sahih Muslim, in another hadith, uh, from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna satakunu ba'di athara wa umurun tunkirunha. Yani they will come after me athara. They will come after me people who prefer the rulers will prefer others over you. They'll give others their haqooq, but they won't give you your haqooq, your rights. And you'll see things that you dislike, things that are evil. Then they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, كَيْفَ تَأْمُرُ مَنْ أَدْرَكَ مِنَّا ذَلِكَ What should we do if this, if we, if this happens to us? The Prophet ﷺ, did he say, rebel against them, fight against them, take your rights by force, go and demonstrate, go, go, to, the, go to the palace of the ruler and, and, and you know, do mudaharat? لا, he said, to adun al haq al ladi alaykum wa tasalun Allah al ladi lakum. Yani you fulfill the rights that is upon you. Fulfill the rights of the ruler and ask Allah for your rights. Ask Allah for your rights. This is in Bukhari and Muslim. In the hadith of Hudayfa, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Sayyakunu ba'di a imma la yahtaduna bi huday wa la yastanuna bi sunnati. They will come after me rulers that will not follow my sunnah and they will not follow my guidance. And they will be amongst them men who will have the hearts of devils in the bodies of men. Is there a worse description than this? This is an evil person. Uh, the Prophet then said, 
they said that they asked the Prophet, كَيْفَ أَصْنَعْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ أَدْرَكُ ذَلِكُ If this happens in my time, O Messenger of Allah, what should I do? قال, the Prophet said, تَسْمَعُ وَتُطِيعُ لِلْأَمِيرِ وَإِنْ ضَرَبَ ظَهْرَكُ وَأَخَذَ مَالَكُ Obey and listen to the ruler, even if he beats your back and takes your, your wealth. This فَاسْمَعْ وَأَطِعْ Obey and hear, hear and obey. This is a Sahih Muslim. So, this is wadih and clear. In another hadith, in, uh, in the Sunnah, in Sunnah, Sunnah ibn Abi Asim, Adi ibn Abi Hatim, he said, we said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا نسألك عن طاعة من اتقى ولكن من فعل وفعل We're not going to ask you about obeying someone who fears Allah But we're going to ask you Should we obey someone who does this and that يعني commit sins على نية These rulers they commit sins openly فذكر الشر So he mentioned many evil things فقال The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم He said اتقوا الله واسمعوا واطيعوا Fear Allah Hear and obey And in another hadith, the Sahaba, they, with regards to the rulers and these tyrant rulers, they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, should we not fight them with the swords? Explicitly asking the Prophet, these tyrant rulers, should we not rebel against them and fight them with the sword? The Prophet said, La, no. As long as they pray. As long as they pray, no. Um, and the Prophet said, Do not, do not remove the hand of allegiance from them. And finally, in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas, the Prophet said, Whoever dislikes something about his ruler, then let him be patient. Did he say, let him rebel? Did he say, incite hatred? Did he say, go on the member and start swearing or insulting the ruler? No. He said, Fal yasbir, let, him, let him be patient. Let him be patient. And the Salaf are all mujmi'un. Al-Imam Al-Fudayr ibn Iyad, Sufyan Al-Thawri, Al-Imam Ahmed himself, they used to say, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ الرَّجُلَ يَدْعُوا لِلسُّلْطَانِ فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ مِنْ أَهْلِ السُّنَّةِ If you see a man making dua for the ruler, then know he's from Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And they would also say, لَوْ كَانَتْ لِي دَعْوَ مُسْتَجَابَةً لَجَعَلْتُهَا فِي الْإِمَامِ If I had one dua left on the earth that I know that I knew that Allah would accept from me this dua, I would make this dua for the ruler. Not for himself or for his mother or I would make it for the ruler. So, Ikhwan fi the Khawarij, especially those that are here today, these Khawarij, Khariji are, are those people who make takfir of the Muslims, by the way. A Khariji is someone who makes takfir on the Muslims and says a Muslim is kafir. Do you understand, Ikhwan? That's a Khariji. And the Madrasa, in, in our time, in the last hundred years, the Madrasa or the school of thought that propagated the Madhab of the Khawarij is uh, a man known as you may have heard called Sayyid Qutb. He was the first proponent of the Khawarij and he made takfir of the Mu'addinun in his books. If you, if you open his books, he made takfir of the Mu'addinun first and foremost. The people saying, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. And he said they are the first to apostate from al Islam. And he made takfir jama'i upon the whole of the Ummah. And then came after him a man called Hassan al Banna who also propagated this. Madhab of takfir. So the khawarij, my brothers, are also those who incite hatred against the rulers. Nowadays, method, you have uh, a type of khariji that is too afraid to make open takfir, explicit takfir. So they make, they imply, they they have, they basically uh, have methods that they use. So they they don't make open takfir, but they incite hatred against the rulers, and then they use the statements that they've. Un misunderstood or misinterpreted statements of some of the ulama and the scholars and these statements my brothers do they are they do they can they go against these ahadith even if any statement of a scholar any state no matter who that is if he says it is allowed to rebel against the rulers is his statement given precedence over these nusus my brothers these ahadith the answer is no to this day 
they are not able to respond to these ahadith because they're so clear, crystal clear. The Prophet ﷺ is being asked, should we rebel against these rulers, tyrant rulers? And the Prophet said, la, no. Falyasbir, the Prophet said, be patient. They mock patience, these people. They don't like patience. When you say to them, patient, patient, be patient, they say, until meta, nasbir. Until when should we be patient? The Prophet ﷺ, in another hadith, he said, fal uh, the Prophet responds to them Be patient until you meet your Lord Until you meet your Lord So these are hadith all indicate to the tahrim al-khuruj That it's haram to rebel against the rulers Incite hatred against the rulers Insult the rulers um, Not because the rulers are giving Ahl sunnah to jama'ah jama Some uh, you know, stipend Or يعني, some money under the table as they say لا, You know and Imam Ahmed, subhanAllah, this is Imam Ahmed saying this. Before that, the Prophet was saying this. The Sahaba all ajma'u ali. Did the Sahaba make khuruj on Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf? Who was, there probably hasn't been a ruler more, more uh, oppressive than Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf in the history of Islam. Do you know what he did? He, subhanAllah, he bombarded the Kaaba. He demolished parts of the Kaaba, my friend. The Kaaba itself and the people of Medina. Rama ahl al-Madina bil manjaneer. Yeah, and the people of Medina, he subhanAllah pelted them with stones. The Kaaba, he pelted it with stones when he was besieging Abdullah ibn Zubayr. He killed some of the most famous Tabi'un. He oppressed the Muslims. He, he did everything under the sun in terms of oppression. In fact, his oppression was so much that some scholars actually made takfir of him. Although the Qawl al Rajah is not a Kafir, he's still a Muslim. Okay? Yet the Sahaba, Anas ibn Malik, Abdullah ibn Abbas, hal, hal kafaruhu, hal kharaju alayhi, did they make khuruj on him? No. Did they make takfir on him? No. Did Imam Ahmed make takfir on al-Mu'tasim or al-Ma'moon when he was being beaten? When Imam Ahmed, all he had to do was say one kalima, one word, and he would have, just with that word, he would have a, a thousand soldiers fighting for him. Yet he said, no, isbiru. He said to the people, isbiru. So, Ikhwan Fila, these are all refutations on the Khawarij. Now. So then we move on. So so far, my brothers, I haven't been counting. I think yeah. So principle number nineteen was revolting against the rule. Now principle number um, eighteen was hearing and obeying the rulers, whether righteous or, or sinful. Then principle number nineteen is revolting against the rulers, contradicts the narrations. We've covered that. Principle twenty is fighting the thieves and revolters is permissible, subject to conditions. Okay. So we're talking about now al bughat Okay, Al Bughat. Al Bughat are people, uh, highway robbers and thieves. So these are people who fight for the dunya purposes, for dunya purposes. So they're not fighting for religious purposes, they're fighting for dunya purposes. So they're known as in Arab in the Mustalah of the Ulama, they're known as Al Bughat or highway robbers. So Al Imam Ahmed, subhanAllah, he says 
with regards to the Bughat, Wala Yahillu Qitalu Sultan, Naam, he says, Wa Qitalu Lususi wal Khawariji Jais. Fighting these Lusus, the thieves and the highway robbers, and the Khawarij is permissible. So, subhanAllah, the Khawarij of today, they say, and they accuse of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, and they say that these uh, Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, even if the ruler attacks their wife, their wives in their home, and their children, they're not even going to defend him. They'll say, Fasma'a wa And they're basically mocking these nusus. Fasma'a wa And subhanAllah, even if these, if a man, if a person, as a man, obviously, you should defend your wife, right? You should defend your family. You should defend your children. If someone comes into your home with, يعني, يعني, uh, an intruder comes into your home, then in Islam, it is, it is your haq and your right to defend your wife from, from this man. To defend your children from this man. This is something that you have to do. Um, and no man يعني, يعني would run away from this and, and leave his wife and his children in harm's way. So Imam Ahmed is talking about this issue. So he says it's permissible for you to fight them. Um, so a person is a, he has to defend himself. And if they leave you, and they leave your house after you've defended yourself, then la يتبعثارهم You don't chase after them. And you don't become a vigilante. And you don't take the law into your own hands. And you leave the matter to the ruler. You call the police. You leave it to the ruler. And the only thing that you can do is تَدْفَعَ nafsik To repel them. And the scholars, they say that you should repel them um, without killing them first. Without murdering, without killing them first. But if the only way to stop them is by killing them and you do kill them, then there is no deer. You don't have to pay any blood money and there is nothing against you um, afterwards. And then he said, al Muhammad says, if, if you die defending your honor, defending yourself, your family, um, then um, inshallah ta'ala you'll be considered from the shuhada, from the martyrs. If you kill them, then he said, فَأَبْعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمَقْتُولُ May Allah, may Allah uh, make that maqtul, the person you, he's killed, the intruder, far removed from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, naam. And he says, وَإِنْ أَخَذَهُ أَسِيرًا If you've taken them prisoner, then you can't kill them. You can't be judge, jury, and executioner. So let's say someone who comes into your home, the intruder, you fight them physically, and then you disarm them, and then you basically hold them captive you cannot kill them and you can't do the had on them you can't just say in your, in your living room khalas you've stolen something from me bring, give me your hand I'm going to cut the, cut your hand off because Allah Azza said <laughs> you don't do that يعني, subhanallah because that's some of the sifat of the khawarij but however you wait for the ruler to judge between you and the ruler to pass judgment on this person and the proof of this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Whoever is killed defending his family is a martyr. Whoever is killed and murdered defending his, himself and his wealth is a martyr, is a shaheed. Naam, so that's principle 20. Naam, tafadl. ولا نشهد ولا نشهد على أحد من أهل القبلة بعمل يعمله بجنة ولا نار نرجو للصالح ونقاف عليه ونقاف على المسيب المذنب ونرجو له ورحمة الله نعم so that chap that's principle 21 we don't testify for or against anyone that they are in paradise or hell except those people whom Allah and his messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم has testified for لا نحكم we don't pass judgment that so-and-so is in Jannah, so-and-so is in the fire. But as Imam Ahmed said, نَخَافُ نَرْجُوا لِلصَّالِحِ We hope the Salih, the person who dies upon piety and righteousness, we hope for them that they enter Jannah. And we still fear for them. And we fear for the Musi, al mudnib the sinner that dies upon sins, we fear that they will enter the fire. But we don't learn najzib, we can't be certain that they will enter the fire. Now. Now, 
chapter tw- uh, sorry principle 22 whoever meets Allah having repented will be forgiven whoever meets Allah having repented will be forgiven naam wa man laqiyahu wa qad uqima alayhi Naam. So chapter uh, principle 23 Whoever meets Allah having had the prescribed punishment Already uh, applied on them and met it out to them In this dunya Then that is an expiation So if a person commits zina And they are stoned a rajim um, obviously conditions have to be met Then that is in and of itself an expiation On Yawm Al-Qiyamah Allah will not punish them They will inshallah ta'ala uh, Will not be punished for that particular sin Whoever steals um, And their hand is cut off Then that is a punishment for them It's an expiation for them And on Yawm Al-Qiyamah They won't be punished again twice for that sin Now Ta'ibin uh, so principle 24 whoever meets Allah having persisted in sin and not repented then his affair is with Allah so whoever meets Allah committing sins without repenting we don't say with certainty they will enter Jahannam. Okay? We say that their affair is with Allah. They are under the Mashiach of Allah. We still fear for them, but we can't say with certainty. Fulan was always drinking alcohol and khamar on Wimslow Road and smoking shisha and doing all sorts of bad things. Everyone knows him. He's been doing that for the last 20 years and he just died yesterday. Okay? So this person. Yeah, and as long as they were praying and upon Islam, like, saying La ilaha illallah, we can't be certain that they're in Jahannam, but we fear for them and we believe that they are taht al Mashiach in the under the Mashiach of Allah Azza wa Jal. Naam. Naam. Principle 25: Whoever meets Allah as a disbeliever, as a kafir, will be punished and not forgiven. Not forgiven. So quickly to recap these four categories of people who commit major sins that Imam Ahmed mentioned. So Imam Ahmed قسم الناس إلى أربعة أقسام في الكبائر. Number one, القسم الأول. Whoever meets Allah with a sin that necessitates Jahannam, the fire, having repented to Allah without continuing that sin, then Allah will accept this person's tawbah. Allah Azza wa will accept this person's tawbah. That's number one. Number two, whoever meets Allah committing major sins and not repenting, okay, this whoever meets Allah committing major sins without repenting, however, the prescribed punishment was meted out to them, was applied to them. They've been caught by the ruler and they were punished. This person is not held to account for that sin on Yawm al Qiyamah. And the punishment of this dunya is an expiation for their sins. Number three, whoever meets Allah with a major sin and hasn't repented uh, from that sin, nor been punished for it in the dunya, then their affair is with Allah, their fate is with Allah. If Allah wants, He will punish them. And if Allah wants, He will forgive them. Finally, number four, whoever meets Allah as a disbeliever, he will be indefinitely punished and will never be forgiven. Now, tafadhal. Afwan, before we move on, Afwan, before we move on to that principle, the ru- what is the ruling on making takfir upon sinners? So takfir is a hukum shari'i. Just like salah, zakah, hajj, takfir is a hukum shari'i. And takfir means removing, min kaffara yukaffiru, takfiran. Removing someone, making someone a kafir. Or labeling someone as a kafir. Saying to someone, anta kafir. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, whoever says to his brother, ya kafir, o kafir, faqad ba'a biha ahaduhuma. Then that word will come back to one of them. One of them is a kafir. 
One of them is a kafir. So takfir is a major uh, ruling. It's a major ruling. And to, before a person makes takfir on another person, then certain conditions have to be made, have to be found in the mukaffir, in the person doing the takfir, and al mukaffaru and the person that the takfir is being applied to, labeled with. Conditions, inshallah ta'ala, from these conditions is that, just generally speaking, we're not going to go into detail, is that the person making takfir has to be someone who is of sound mind, has to be someone who is mukallaf, aqil, muslim, someone who is basically sincere, mukhlis as well, and someone who has ilm and knowledge, someone who has knowledge and ilm. As for the person who takfir is being made applied to, then this person, before takfir is applied to them, then that person, the proof has to be established upon them. They have to be aware that what they're doing is actually kufr and disbelief. And they, it has to be explained to them. And intifa'ul mawani' and the barriers and the things that may prevent them from understanding the evidences need to be removed. There's no point speak if someone, for example, doesn't speak Arabic. There's no point giving them these, these no source in Arabic. You have to explain it to them. So all of these conditions have to be met. We have to make sure are they ignorant of the rulings. And some types of, some rulings are ignorance isn't allowed in them and some ignorance is allowed on, uh, for them. So we have to look at the hal of the person. Do they live with the Muslims or are they living in the Amazon forest on their own, for example? So if a person is living in the Amazon forest, never see, read any Qur'an, they say la ilaha illallah, they know يعني, um, Islam, but subhanAllah, they never pray, they don't know what salah is, مثلاً, يعني, that person has a different hukum and ruling than a person, for example, who lives in Mecca and Medina, for example, and falls into this same sin, right? So all of these things are applicable, all of, we have to look at all of these variables, all of these matters, okay? Um, so generally speaking, if a person commits a sin, then this person is not considered to be a Muslim, sorry, is not considered to be a Kafir, unless they do what's known as Istihlal. They make the sin, sin halal for themselves, or they believe that that particular sin is halal. Okay? So, for example, um, if fighting a Muslim is considered to be a major sin, right? But Allah Azza wa said, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اَقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا When two groups of believers fight each other, then reconcile between them. So Allah labeled them as believers, although they fight against each other. So that means that falling into major sins doesn't remove someone from the fold of an Islam. Now, chapter Now. So, principle 26 says that stoning is the, is the rightful due um, and is the rightful punishment of the person who has been married and commits zina. So, if a person commits zina, then the punishment that has been prescribed against them is a rajan. Is a rajan. If the person who committed zina has never married before, has never tasted marriage before, then... For them is they are, they are whipped and lashed 80 times and taghribu sana and they are expelled for a year from that from their land if there is a maslaha some scholars they say if there's a maslaha nowadays if you expel that person and take to another country they may do the same thing again because there's no eyes on them now so maybe in that instance a prison term of one year could take could be if the imam sees fit could take that in its place if the person has been married before, then a rajim is prescribed against them. Allah Azza wa Jalla He says, that's uh, now this ayah is mansukha by the way, mansukha to lafzan, not hukman. Allah an azaniya to azani, farjumuhuma nakalan al batta. Allah says. So this ayah is an ayah that has been abrogated. It's no longer in the Mus'haf. It's the, the wording has been abrogated, but the hukum is still present. Okay? It, the hukum is still present from the hadith of Aisha. So Allah says the zani and the zaniya. Okay? The zani and the zaniya. Then farjumuhuma. Then uh, stone them. Allah says stone them. 
As for the other ayah, that's Azani was Azani to Azani. Fajl ayah. Fajliduhuma. Naam. So that ayah basically says the Zani and the Zani, and then uh, lash them all with them. That's a different ayah. So that shows us, my brothers, as that the Zani and the Zani, they, their hukum is that they have to be uh, stoned um, if certain conditions are met that are mentioned in the books of uh, fiqh. Naam. ومن اتقص أحدا من أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو أبقده في حدث كان من أو ذكر مساويه مساويه كان مبتدئا مبت... حتى يترحم عليهم حتى يترحم عليهم جميعا ويكون ويكون قلبه لهم سليما والنفاق هو نعم so chapter 27 um, we're going to just take a quick 10-minute uh, break, inshallah, and then we only have a few more principles left. Principle 27. We'll continue in about 10 minutes, inshallah. Taala. Jazakumullah khairan. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi sahbihi ma'in. Naam. Then he says, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He says, "Wa man intaqsa ahadan." Qarat hala, sah? Wa man intaqsa ahadan. Yani min ashab Rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whoever degrades, insults. Anyone from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Or even a single member of the Sahaba um, Or hates them And mentions their Mentions anything derogatory about the Sahaba Kana mubtadi'a This person is a mubtadi' and an innovator Okay So whoever mocks the Sahaba Belittles the Sahaba Ridicules the Sahaba Criticizes the Sahaba Alright um, so this person is a mubtada. So there are four, in yeah, there are four categories of people uh, who negative, who speak about the, the Sahaba in a negative light, in a negative way. Okay. And um, I'm going to tell you that these four types of people and their hukum, their ruling. So number one, if someone makes takfir of all or most of the companions, then this person is a kafir. So if anyone makes takfir of all or, or some of the companions or most of the companions, this person is a kafir. If someone makes takfir of just one sahabi and says, well, this sahabi is a kafir, but all of the rest are Muslims or mu'mineen, then this person is also a kafir and a disbeliever. If anyone declares any of the sahaba as sinners, and if anyone uh, declares any of the sahaba are sinners, are usat, then this person is also a kafir. Number four, if, if someone mentions the faults of a companion, uh, a, a, a physical fault of a companion, a physical uh, yani, uh, deficiency in a companion or a deficiency in their intellect, um, or method and speaks about their honor, not their honor, sorry, their bravery, then this person has fallen into a major sin and is a mubtadi' and this is the fault this is who Imam Ahmad is referring to here Naam, tafadl Naam Knowing that everyone except the prophets does uh, sins so if, if someone says that the sahaba Naam, the sahaba obviously can fall into sin sah, but to say he is a sinner this Sahabi is a Asi. This is Kufr. How do this, does he know he was a Asi? What is, yani that's a derogatory, something you call min shan is Sahaba. Okay? No. Yeah. Okay. So 
ومثل كفر بالله تبرؤ من من نسب من نسب وإن تقطع ونحن هذه الأحاديث مما قد صح وحفظ فإن لم فإن نسلم له وإن لم نعلم تفسيرها ولا نتكلم ولا نتكلم فيها ولا نجادل فيها ولا نفس ولا نفسر في نفسر ولا نفسر هذه هذه الأحاديث إلا مثل ما جاءت لا نردها إلا بالحق Now, chapter uh, principle 28 is the ta'rif for nifaq the definition of hypocrisy so hypocrisy is divided into minor hypocrisy and major hypocrisy so minor hypocrisy is the hypocrisy of the actions and major hypocrisy is the hypocrisy hypocrisy of the heart so major nifaq is if a person disbelieves in allah worships other than allah whilst portraying islam outwardly so it is to believe in islam outwardly but to disbelieve in Allah inwardly. This is major nifaq. As for minor nifaq, then there, the examples that Imam Ahmed mentions these examples here. يعني ثلاث من كنا فيه فهو منافق. يعني three traits, if they're found in a person, then this person is a munafiq. And these traits are إذا, يعني إذا وعد أخلف, إذا عاهد غدر, إذا أتمن خان. In other narrations, إذا, 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 إذا تكلم uh, يعني uh, كذب أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم. So if he if he promises, he breaks his promise. He breaks his oath. He's treacherous. Um, if he speaks, he lies. These are these the prophet is referring to a nifaq al amali, the minor nifaq or the nifaq of actions, which is the minor nifaq. Um, نعم. So then he mentions types of kufr as well. So he then talks about a hadith al wa'id. So there in the nusus there are in terms of uh, in terms of the reward or the punishment in a nas in a delil then they're divided into two in terms of the reward and punishments in the adilla then these adilla are divided into two nususul wa'd wa nususul wa'id nususul wa'd what are they my brothers what are nususul wa'd promise no promise so it's like reward reward no so evidences that promise you good things. So a dilla dalil that says if you do such and such, you will get jannah or you will give, be given something nice. Examples of nusus al wad. Any examples? No. The? No. Sends na'am. So the hadith of, as Yusuf mentioned, the hadith of whoever sends peace and salutations upon the Prophet وسلم, then Allah جل, sends peace and salutations or oh, this person is rewarded يعني, and, and they give, get they get an ajr or reward. Um, and many hadith. So they're known as Nusus al Wa'id. Nususul the opposite are Nusus al Wa'id. What are Nusus al Wa'id? Naam, the uh, Nusus or evidences of punishment and threat. So examples here, he gave many examples for you. Here, مثلا, the Prophet ﷺ said لا ترجعوا بعدي كفارا ضلالا يضرب بعضكم رقاب بعض Don't become disbelievers after me striking each other's necks So the Prophet ﷺ here is saying that striking each other's necks and fighting each other is disbelief is kufr, is a, is, is kufr. And also إذا التقى المسلمان بسيفيهما فالقاتل والمقتول في النار Also سباب المسلم فسوق وقتاله كفر من قال لأخيه يا كافر فقد باء بها أحدهما كفر بالله تبرؤ من نسب وإندق All of these نصوص that you have translated in front of you All of them are نصوص الوعيد They are, they are their threats If you do X, Y, Z You will get this Something bad will happen to you You are a kafir You are this You are a munafiq نصوص الوعيد they threat, they give, There is a threat of punishment In these نصوص Alright So he's saying هذه الحديث How do we interact with them is fighting the, a Muslim kufr? Let me ask you, is fighting Muslim kufr? Disbelief? Hmm? No, I'm talking about kufr akbar. Yukhrij min al-Islam. Is it kufr akbar? No. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, qitaluhu kufr here. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, يعني, uh, يعني the Prophet ﷺ said لا ترجع بعد كفارا يضرب so the Prophet described the person who fights a Muslim as a kafir so Imam Ahmed is saying these evidences we leave them as they are 
without interpreting them because interpreting them to the general public will lessen their severity in the hearts of the people. If a, if a general Muslim, you say to them, the Prophet said, fight. imagine you go to a people who fight each other all the time. They're always striking each other, they're killing each other. And then you say to them, the Prophet says, قتال المسلم كفر is disbelief. Then subhanAllah, it's, they're, going to, they're going to stop. They're going to say, kufr, yes, it's disbelief. Let them understand the major kufr from it. Does that make sense? However, when you're with students of knowledge, we understand these nusus according to how they are. So the kufr that the Prophet ﷺ is referring to here is kufr asghar, is minor kufr. Kufrun duna kufr. Do you understand? It's the minor kufr, the one that doesn't leave the fold of it, that doesn't cause you to leave the fold of it, Islam. But it is still worse than a major sin. It's still worse than a major sin. Do you understand, Ikhwani? So he says, فَإِنَّا نُسَلِّمُ لَهُ we submit ourselves to these ahadith even if we don't know their tafsir and their explanation we don't try to explain them we don't try to argue these ahadith um, and we leave them as they are we leave them as they are so that is uh, principle 28 Naam. principle 29 Naam. So principle 29 says Jannah and Nar are two created things. So all of the ulama are in agreement that Jannah and Nar are created entities and they've already been created. So they've already been created. The Mu'tazila however say that they're not created and they, they use their aql and their intellect and they say they've not been created they say it makes no sense to create them for Allah because it's a waste of time and no one is going to enter Jannah and Nar now so why would Allah create them anyway that's what they believe in which is obviously false and batil hence why Imam Ahmed mentioned this as part of the principles of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah so um, the evidence is that Jannah and Nar are created and their presence now are as follows. Number one, Allah Azza wa tells us that the souls of the believers after on Yawm al Qiyamah will be in Jannah and the souls of the, the disbelievers are going to be punished in the fire. And Allah tells us that these souls have been, uh, that, that the Jannah has been prepared for them. So Allah Azza wa says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ it has been prepared for the muttaqin. Uiddat is fi'l madi. It's in the past. So if they've been, pre- if it's, if Jannah has been prepared for the believers, that means it's already created. Also with regard to Jahannam, so that's in Surah Al Imran, verse one three three. In Surah Al Baqarah, verse twenty four, Allah says, "فَإِلَّا تَفْعَلُ وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُ فَتَقُلْ نَارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةُ إِشْ Uiddat لِلْكَافِرِينَ." Okay, so it's been prepared for the kafirin. So nar has been prepared. So if it's been prepared, it means it's been ish created. Um, naam. As for so that's with regards to the creation, right? So he he spoke about the fact that jannah and nar has been created. So now you have the evidences, right? What is the evidence that they are eternal? What do we mean by eternal? Huh? For everlasting, they're eternal. Means that they'll never end. Jannah and nar will be ongoing for all of eternity forever and ever and ever okay what's the proof of that Allah Azza wa Jal he said illa tariqa jahannama khalidina fiha abada yeah, and Allah says regarding jahannam that they will be in jahannam uh, forever khalidina fiha abada wa kana thalika ala Allah yasira jameel so there are people that say um, that jannah and nar are not eternal and that Allah Azza wa Jal will punish 
uh, عفن, there are people that say that they say Jannah and Nar, but let's focus on Nar because this is where the major khilaf is. There are people that say Jahannam, the Nar, is not abadi, it's not eternal, and that the disbelievers will be burnt in Jahannam for <coughs> a period of time, and then for that only Allah knows, and then they will be removed from Jahannam, they will be destroyed. And others they say, from Ahlul Kalam, they say that they, Jahannam will be transformed into something else. And others say the people will be removed, but Jahannam will remain. Or, and there's, other, there's those that say Jahannam will be destroyed. And the people will also be destroyed in them. Okay? So, uh, um, let's, let's structure this properly. Let's structure this properly. Sheikh Muhammad al Amin al Shanqiti, you know who he is, right? What book did he author from on Tafsir? Does anyone know that? Naam. Adwa ul Bayan. He authored Adwa ul Bayan. Did he complete it? No. He didn't complete it. Who completed it? His student, one of the great scholars, Sheikh Atiyah Salim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Rahimahullah Ta'ala Jami'an, completed the last from Surah from Al Bujad al Qad Sami'. So, he says that there are five possible possibilities here. So he used one of the evidences in Usul al-Fiqh known as As-Sabr wa-Taqseem. Ish ma'ana As-Sabr wa-Taqseem? What's Sabr wa-Taqseem? In Usul al-Fiqh, naam, fudun. Naam, mentioning all the logical possibilities and then crossing them off one by one. Okay, so what is the issue we're talking about, my brothers? What is the issue that we're talking about? Is Jahannam eternal? This is the question. Is Jahannam eternal? So before he even responded, he said, let's go and look at all of the possibilities. So the first possibility is that Jahannam is not is non-existent. Is non sorry, is not, not eternal. That Jahannam is not eternal. And the people of Jahannam, the inhabitants of Jahannam, they will rest from, ja from the punishment because Allah will destroy them. This is one possibility, he says. He's not, so out of these five possibilities, only one is haq and four are batil, are false. So the first possibility, he says, is that Jahannam is non-eternal, not eternal. Um, Allah will destroy the inhabitants of the fire and they will rest. This is rejected by the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla in Surah An-Nisa, verse 56: "Inna al-ladina kafaru bi ayatina sawfa nuslihim nara, kullama nadijat juludhum badalnahum juludan ghairha liyadhuqu al-adab." Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Inna al-ladina kafaru bi ayatina, those who disbelieved in our ayat, sawfa nuslihim nara, we will burn them in Jahannam. Kullama nadijat juludhum, every time their skins are roasted." We will change their skins for other skin, for another skin. So they may taste the punishment. In this ayah, isn't it clear that they will not rest from Jahannam? Wadih, sah? They will not rest from Jahannam. Okay? The word kullama indicates mada? Naam, repetition, tikrar. Kullama. The word kullama it means every time. Kullama nadijat juluduhum. Every time their skins will iyadu billah. May Allah save us from this torment. Every time their skins are roasted in Jahannam and blackened and turned into charcoal, Allah replenishes their skin, gives them another skin. Will iyadu billah. Does that make sense, Ikhwan Fillah? So as you can see, aqidah, Ikhwan Fillah, isn't in this, in studying aqidah. Isn't there wa'd and admonishment in Aqeedah when you're reading these verses? Do you understand? There's, there's mawa'id in Aqeedah. So this is the first possibility. The second, which is batil. The second possibility is that is to say that the fire, Jahannam, is eternal. But the people in Jahannam are not eternal. They will die and perish. So meaning that Jahannam will be empty. There will come a time when Jahannam will be empty. This is rejected by the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal 
يتجرأه ولا يكاد يصيغه ويأتيه الموت من كل مكان وما هو بميت سبحان الله إخواني في الميت الله سيف أسرم جهنم ومن ورائه عذاب غليظ الله عز وجل says يتجرأه you know تجرأ is to make someone drink something they dislike by force opening their mouth and making them drink something that they dislike so they will sip it unwillingly the malaika will force feed them make them drink the burning fire and death will come to them they will have great difficulty in swallowing it down their throat death will come to them from every side but they will not die subhanallah even death, death in jahannam they will not get death death is like a raha they will not die Allah says وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِ عَذَابٌ غَلِيدٌ And in front of them is a greater torment. That's the second possibility, which is batin. The third possibility is to say that the people of Jahannam will be removed from the fire. They will be removed. It doesn't matter where they will be taken. But Jahannam will remain, the opposite. Okay? Um... Jahannam will remain or will be pe- will perish as well. It doesn't really matter. Both are the same. The pr- this is rejected by the statement of Allah. كُلَّمَا أَرَادُوا أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا مَاذَا؟ أُعِيدُوا فِيهَا وَذُوقُوا عَذَابَ النَّارُ نعم وقيل لهم ذُوقُوا عَذَابَ النَّارُ So, كُلَّمَا أَرَادُوا Every time they want to escape Jahannam, they are returned into Jahannam. So they can't even escape. So that means the people, the inhabitants of the fire will be there forever. Because kullama means tikrar. Kullama means it will happen continuously, again and again. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنَ النَّارِ In Surah Al-Baqarah verse 167, they will not be removed from the fire. The fourth, number four, is that they will remain in the fire and not be removed. However, the punishment is lightened for them. يُخَفَّفْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْعَذَابِ This is a possible me. This is this this is a possibility. So they'll remain in the fire, but the fire will be reduced from them. Okay? Or or the fire becomes pleasure. تَسْتَحِيلُ لَذَّةً The fire will be. They'll be so used to the fire that it will turn into. They'll become used to the fire and they'll become turning. There's some people that say this, Ikhwan. That's why the scholars are refuting this. The fire becomes pleasure. This is rejected by Allah because Allah says in Surah Al-Fatir, verse 36, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمَ لَا يُقْضَى عَلَيْهِمْ فَيَمُوتُوا وَلَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمْ مِنْ عَذَابِهَا Allah says those who disbelieve, they will have نَارُ جَهَنَّمْ لَا يُقْضَى عَلَيْهِمْ فَيَمُوتُوا They will not be killed. وَلَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمْ مِنْ عَذَابِهَا And the punishment will not be lessened. So that's wadih that the punishment is not lessened. And in Surah Al-Naba' verse 30, Allah says, فَذُوقُوا مَاذَا فَلَنْ نَزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا Taste the punishment, we will not increase you except in adab. Subhanallah, ikhwan. That means that Jahannam, the, the, the torment in Jahannam is not in one level. It gets worse and worse and worse. They'll not even get used to it. It's not the same, and every day Allah Azza wa Jal will punish them even more severely than the day before. Al-Iyad Billah. Nas'Allah Ta'ala an yaqiyana min nari jahannam. Subhanallah. Number five, Ikhwani number five, the fifth possibility. So that, that means four possibilities are batil, which leaves only one possibility, which is that the inhabitants of the fire, those who are not upon tawheed, will live there for all of eternity. And all of the adilla indicate to this. Sheikh Muhammad al Amin al Shanqiti, he mentions this in his book, Daf'u Iham al Ittirab and Ayy al Kitab, repelling the perceived contradictions in the Quran. He refutes the contradictions that are perceived in the Quran with the Quran itself. So it's a very good book if you can find it, inshallah. Naam, tafadl. ومن مات من أهل القلة واحدا يصلى عليه ويستغفر ويستغفر له ولا ولا يحجب ولا يحجب عنه استغفار ولا تترك الصلاة ولا تترك الصلاة عليه لذنب أذنبه صغيرة صغيرة أو كبيرة صغيرة كان أو كبيرة صغيرة كان أو كبيرة 
أمره إلى الله تعالى آخر رسالة والحمد لله والحمد لله وعد وصلاة وصلاة على محمد وعلى آله وسلم وتسليم نعم. So uh, principle thirty, final principle, he says is that whoever dies as a muwahid, then this person deserves salatul janaza. Then this person, we pray upon this person, we perform prayer upon them, and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive them. And mata min ahlil qibla. So the word ahlul qibla, this term is used for the people of the qibla, the people of the salah, which means the person who doesn't pray, is he from ahlul qibla? الذي لا يصلي هل هو من أهل القبلة؟ لا هو أصلا لا يتجه للقبلة. This person doesn't face the qibla, right? So the people of the qibla are those people who died upon tawhid, upon لا إله إلا الله, and they are the people of the qibla. They are the people of the salah. So you salla alayhi. When this person dies, it is wajib for a group of the believers to pray salatul janaza upon this person. We يستغفر الله. We seek Allah Allah's forgiveness for them. لا يحجب عنه الاستغفار. So استغفار is not they're not uh, with استغفار isn't withheld from them. لا تترك الصلاة عليه لذنب أذنبه صغيرا أكان أو كبيرا. So even if they died upon a major sin, we still have to pray upon them, and we believe that their amr and their affair is with Allah عز وجل. And this is the end of the رسالة أصول السنة. والحمد لله وحده وصلاته على محمد وآله وسلم تسليما. الحمد لله الذي بنعمته تتم الصالحات. Khwani, so that's 30 principles we've covered, right? So you have all these 30 principles that are found in the in Usul Sunnah. Go do muraja'ah. You can actually memorize this risal. It's very easy to memorize. Read it numerous times, and you will have the Usul of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah right there in front of you. <laughs>